Hello, this is Chuck Stell looking at market power and the oil industry. And what I'd like to start with is the Standard Oil Company. So unlike agriculture, where farms are small relative to the market and each firm is a price taker, oil has a long history of large firms, large firms with market power, the power to raise prices. This week we'll look at two examples. Uh, in this presentation, um, a history-making case in the refining sector of the industry, the Standard Oil case, which was about a century ago. And then um, in our next video, uh, we'll look at crude oil production with the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, or OPEC. So starting with the refining, the structure of the refining, um, oil refining, industry is really tied to the history of one company, and that is Standard Oil. Standard Oil was established by John D. Rockefeller in 1862 and incorporated in 1870. Rockefeller, Rockefeller built large, efficient refining plants, taking advantage of the economies of scale. And by 1870, it was the largest U.S. refiner with about 10% of U.S. capacity. At that point, Rockefeller started acquiring competitors, eventually accumulating over 100 formerly independent companies to form uh, the Standard Oil Trust. The actions of Standard were to control the entire market through a series of horizontal mergers. A horizontal merger is buying a direct competitor. So Standard Oil used a wide variety of strategic behavior to limit the success of competing firms. They would use differential pricing, pricing lower in uh, an area where they are trying to uh, damage a rival. They would purchase a rival's customers who were industrial customers, cutting them off from their market. They would control pipelines, cutting off access. Um, they used buying power or monopsony uh, in order to get pref preferential treatment from the railroads, uh, and often using that as a way to increase their rivals' costs. The rivals found that they could not compete with Standard Oil, um, who was using such aggressive tactics against them, and Standard Oil was then happy to buy up their rivals um, and, and include them into the Standard Oil company. By 1880, so a mere 10 years afterward, the Standard Oil Trust had accumulated about 90% of the U.S. refining um, capacity in terms of its market share. Now, in response to um, the Standard Oil Trust and other large trusts in other industries, the Sherman Antitrust Act was passed in 1890. It has two important sections. Section 1 makes it illegal to restrain trade. Um, this would be price fixing or conspiracies. Um, this was what was used uh, against dairies in the school milk cases we talked about in the very beginning of this quarter. Uh, Section 2 prohibits monopolization, both uh, successful and attempted monopolization or conspiracy to uh, become a monopoly. Let me read... Um, just a little bit of, of language from the Sherman Act. Um, so let me start with Section 2. Section 1 has similar wording but focused on a conspiracy and restraint of trade. Section 2 of the Sherman Act. Every person who shall monopolize or attempt to monopolize or combine or conspire with any other person or persons to monopolize any part of the trade or commerce among the several states or with foreign nations shall be deemed guilty of a misdemeanor, and on conviction thereof shall be punished by a fine not exceeding $5,000. Now that has been increased uh, in today's dollars to $100 million for a corporation, a $1 million for uh, an individual. Um, so, not, so the fine and then, uh, or by imprisonment not exceeding one year, or by both said punishments at the discretion of the court. And again, that... Um, Punishment has been increased to a maximum of 10 years in, um, with the revisions of the law. Now, in the early years of antitrust, the Sherman Act enforcement focused on Section 1, 
Firms would be accused of price fixing. They would then stop competing with each other. They would um, merge together into a single firm and set price internally. So in those early years, we saw a continuation of horizontal mergers and increasing market concentration in many industries across the U.S. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those other cases when we get to our antitrust section later this term. By 1906, an important Section 2 case was brought against Standard Oil. Like later Section 2 cases, this was a lengthy process with many appeals. Um, monopolization is hard to prove. It uses a very um, demanding legal standard known as the rule of reason. Um, but after years of um, court hearings, Standard Oil was found guilty. And um, after years of appeal in 1911, the Supreme Court finalized that decision. Standard Oil was then broken up into um, competing companies because they were found guilty of violating Section 2 of the Sherman Act monopolization. So there were 34 separate companies, including many major refining companies. Now, the initial impact on competition was minor because Rockefeller still controlled each of these companies through stock ownership. So this wasn't nationalization or socialism. It was simply changing the structure of the market. Eventually, these firms did start to become serious competitors, um, and part of that was the stock ownership became diluted as it went through generations of the Rockefeller family and was sold to other people. Now, one thing I do want to note this is all taking place before there was widespread ownership of cars. Uh, Ford released the Model T shortly after the case started and didn't perfect mass production of the Model T and after, until uh, after the breakup. Um, so some of the big companies that were originally all part of Standard Oil um, were what we later knew is Exxon, Mobil, Chevron, Amoco, Sohio, Arco, Conoco, Marathon, uh, some other smaller refineries, uh, several pipeline companies, and then um, companies making uh, related products like um, Cheeseboro Palms, who makes uh, Vaseline, and Pennzoil, uh, who makes uh, motor lubricants. With time, other firms did become successfully established, and part of that is because um, of state antitrust laws, particularly in Texas, that allowed entrants to successfully um, compete. So some of the uh, companies that, that really became important um, after the breakup of the Standard Oil were Gulf in Texaco, um, Union Oil uh, based in California, as well as multinationals uh, who entered the U.S. like Shell. Essentially, if we look at those biggest components of Standard Oil plus some of these major competitors, these oil majors um, became the dominant um, players for most of the 20th century. These were sometimes known as the Seven Sisters. Um, so the Seven Sisters were British Petroleum, Gulf Oil, Shell, Chevron, which was Standard Oil of California, Exxon, which had been Standard Oil of New Jersey, then Esso, then Exxon, Mobil, which was Standard Oil Company of New York, or Ciccone, and then Mobil, and then Texaco. Um, so those seven sisters controlled about 85% of oil reserves globally. They were active in joint ventures and cooperative agreements to develop and operate oil fields in the Middle East and in other countries. These private firms really controlled price um, and movement of oil around the world. Um, they posted prices and decided how much they were going to um, pay the countries who, where oil was produced, and they kept prices stable over a long period of time. Now, towards the end of the 20th and into the 20th, um, 21st century, 
uh, we saw a spate of mergers in the um, oil companies, and now our current oil majors are even bigger than the Seven Sisters had been in the 20th century. So British Petroleum acquired Amoco and Arco and had previously, um, um, so Ohio had previously merged into to those um, in 1999. Exxon and Mobil merged. Uh, Chevron acquired Texaco in 2001. Um, uh, Total uh, acquired a couple of Europe, Total uh, based in France, uh, acquired a couple of European um, competitors, Petrofina and Elf Equitin. Um, and those became our super majors. And again, these are all large, multinational, vertically integrated oil companies. Right? Hugely powerful, hugely influential. But for the last several decades, they have not been the only source of power in the oil industry. And that's what our next presentation will look at. Uh, OPEC, right, whose power arose at the end of the 20th century. This has been Chuck Stahl talking about standard oil, um, antitrust, and the structure of the oil industry. Uh, thank you for listening.